It's now 1.30. I introduced Dennis Boyle. He's, as I mentioned earlier in the audience, but it's worth re-mentioning. He's been a great man to me, putting the, this conference, designing this conference. Um, he provided guidance and advice every step of the way. He's, uh, his story, he's a partner and founding team member of IDEO. Um, and leads the design for health portfolio at Adia and the Palo Alto offices where they come to San Francisco frequently. He's also a consulting assistant professor at Stanford's D School. And he's going to be working with Farzad uh, Azimpur. Dr. Farzad Azimpur serves as the director of health at Adia, adjunct professor at Stanford University School of Medicine, assistant director of design at Stanford Biodesign School. And together, the team will introduce us in a very practical way to design thinking in healthcare. Right. Thank you. Testing. All right. Thanks very much, Stefano. It's very exciting. Last year was here and it was cool. This year it's way cooler. So there's a there's a, this is there's a real movement starting right here, and Stefano's in the right in the center of it. So it's lovely to be part of it. So we got a just a, a quick little design thinking session here. It'll I think you'll find it interesting. You know we keep getting asked to explain and demonstrate and do a design thinking workshop in less and less time. It's like explaining relativity sometimes. But well, we're going to give it a shot in one hour here. But it should be fun. All right. Well, now I need a button. This one. All right. Uh, I also want to uh, um, recognize John Ravitch, one of my fellow IDEO partners, his wife, Adisa Wilmer, who's a physician uh, with her own practice in Oakland, and my t teaching assistant from Stanford, Ben Alpers, who are kind of going to help with the, all the um, workshop. Wh who's IDEO? Uh, we started um, right downtown on, uh, on University Avenue, right off campus. We were a bunch of friends at Stanford. That's me with 1970s glasses and no gray hair there and a tie. Um, so now we're 700 people. Uh, we are in uh, nine different locations around the war U.S. and Europe and Asia. Uh, we, we started as mechanical engineers, industrial designers, and we did computers and high-tech things and medical products uh, from the very get-go. So now, well, there's 18, 20 different disciplines, and uh, we still do computers and high-tech products, but there's a whole host of other things. In fact, it's easier to say that we just don't design uh, tobacco products and firearms and gambling uh, products of any sort. So uh, everything else seems to apply for des this, this design process. Um, but the, the, uh, the net, at the heart of our work is this process, this framework of design thinking used with multidisciplinary teams. We m more or less pioneered this, but a lot of people do it now, so it's not anything we own uh, by any means, but I'll just kind of work our way through how we approach it, and a lot of people, this is not news to most all of you, I think, but will be a little bit of a reinforcement. It's this process that is fundamentally human-centered in its approach. Now, as technologists, as an engineer, uh, as business people, we want to start with what, what's what's viable, what's feasible, what's technical, what's what what the business model is. But really, over the years, all of us as technologists have uh, embraced this whole mission of starting with the people, what's desirable. Uh, this is w how design thinking seems to be the most successful. And, and then this overlapping kind of uh, Venn diagram, we like to, everything results in some sort of little diagram, it seems, but uh, the innovation is best to form, form served by this approach in our experience. Uh, and, and, and it's a relatively simple process that overlaps. This, there's an inspiration phase, there's an ideation phase, and there's an implementation phase. And these can be a few hours each, a few days, a few weeks, months, and in cases of our medical stuff, it's, well, it's longer than that. But uh, we've had a lot of luck by kind of adhering to this general format and framework. Uh, these kind of projects start with how might we, what if, what is the future of, 
um, and, and, and open-ended question so you don't have the answer in the question. Uh, early work, the uh, first, uh, first commercial mouse, uh, I was there when somebody ran in and yelled at us that he wanted a $10 mouse and ran out and we didn't even know what a mouse was, but well, we got to design the first Apple mouse. <coughs> Uh, and for early insulin pens for, uh, uh, and uh, for, for some of the very first palm, uh, handhelds for Palm, uh, the first laptop, the, the, the first um, camera. In fact, uh, that was a, that's my five-year-old son on that picture of, of the handspring visor, and now he's 23, so that uh, dates that. The first defibrillator, and you'll be hearing more about that in, uh, in, in a few minutes. <clears throat> some, uh, we, we've branched out way beyond product design. In fact, product design is probably a minor, more minor part than the things we think of as experience design. Uh, the, for Walgreens ex Pharmacy, for Converse branded stores, for the North Face in China, the St. Joseph Healthcare System. What are the experience of the people, the customers, the patients, the healthcare providers, the, the workers in these spaces? So there's a lot of work in that in this area that design thinking seems to be very valuable for. TSA, uh, training the TSO agents, I'm almost everybody in this room has just experienced this in the last probably 24 hours. Um, I, I, I'm here to say that, well, you're going to say that it's not that much better, or it's not better at all, but um, luckily, um, I think with the work we did with 55,000 TSO agents, it, it has improved. What's, the experience has been better. You can argue about that, but it's, uh, uh, and that's about all I'm supposed to say about that. <laughs> How might we enable entrepreneurs to improve sanitation in Ghana, uh, the IDO.org, worked carefully to design a very bulletproof, lightweight kind of camping toilet, but the real innovation was to have a whole uh, service uh, around uh, em cleaning, emptying the tanks, uh, and, and um, having a, a continuing um, uh, a kind of a service uh, subscription and, and now uh, employs hundreds of people and uh, serves tens of thousands of uh, families in, in, in Africa. So this is a lovely ex example of um, design and business um, being successful uh, in the developing world. Uh, one device for all, how might we change the, make the experience of voting better in, in, in the county of Los Angeles? It's a very poor turnout for many reasons. One of them is because there's 80 or 90 different languages spoken. Uh, there's a lot of people with disabilities. Uh, a lot of, it's a very spread out kind of a county. So th this is a, um, a system to allow people with disabilities, to, with any number of different languages, and, and any number of approaches to vote. Uh, in a much more uh, simple, logical, and, and um, better experience manner. Uh, uh, this is an interesting thing. Uh, Pill Pack was a, a startup in residence in more East Coast office, um, but it came out of a, a workshop uh, at MIT Media Labs, much like this, actually. This whole idea of how might we make the effort to stay in multiple medications easier over time. Uh, you know, 50% of all Americans, or some large number, uh, have multiple medications, and so there's some, there's, it's a challenge constantly to trying to figure out if, if you've got the right refill or you have the refill. So this is a, a, a lovely um, service that's now become successful, and you get a, little, a box every two to four weeks with a little sachet with the date, the time, the day on it, and much easier to stay on your medications. Um, Alive Core, uh, my, my cardiologist partner here might uh, <coughs> refer to this a little bit, and he carries one in his pocket, of course. Uh, how might we help people understand their cardiac health uh, with something that you carry with you, or it's on the back of your smartphone or on your watch band now? Um, uh, lots of work for um, farm over the years. H how do you make this whole experience of people just starting an injection ex uh, regime? Because, well, easy for us all to say that have some experience in designing these things, but the needle is a, is, is a very frightful thing to contemplate when you're just beginning. So this is an auto injector that's become successful because it you can line it up, press a button, you can look at it, you don't have to look at it, but it delivers the right amount of uh, medication for the right amount of time and then it pulls the needle away and 
tucks it away and so you can't dan uh, hurt yourself or make any mistakes essentially so that's a uh, this is work we've done for with Levi's and Google to make a, a, a commuter style jacket that uh, a, com a bike commuter or a commuter can control uh, their music or the phone or the directions that they they have on their earbuds through uh, gestures on on their um, on their jacket. Uh, this is a recent uh, uh, device um, for a startup called Willow in in, uh, in Mountain View, and uh, the whole experience of of uh, pumping for new mothers is just so you can't say enough bad things about it. I'm sure all the mothers in the in the room will, and many of the fathers will agree. Um, but this is a device that's worn on a person, makes a lot for more freedom, puts the the um, mother's milk in a, in a small, easily used bag, and you're, you're free to go about your business. Much, m take a look at that. Anyway, um, today we, um, we're going to just spend a little bit of time on emphasizing a, one or two things about why brainstorming is important, but how to do it in a, in a more productive way. Um, so we want you to be deliberate about this process. And there, are, we have these guidelines, these rules. And number one is defer judgment, because if you are going to complain about someone's ideas that's, that's at your table, uh, in your group, uh, well, they'll, you'll, you'll shut them down. But the thing we're going to emphasize today is this encouraging wild ideas, um, because this gets you out of your groove, and we'll get back to this in a minute. And then the other ones build on, idea, on the ideas of others, stay focused on the topic, one conversation at a time, be visual, go for quantity. So all these rules are in little cards at your table. So everybody gets to walk away with one of these as a prompt. And so, um, but again, we're going to emphasize today because we have just this little cycle, encouraging wild ideas. <coughs> Lots of people have brainstorming sessions, but the thing that we see kind of slows them down is if you're trying to think too practically, if you're trying to get an idea that's really good right out of the gate, well, it, it just slows you down. So what we've found is if you really push the limit, if you uh, um, are surprising yourself and your, your fellow brainstormers with ideas, or shocking them even, making them laugh, th this gets you out in front of this and uh, ideas are more disruptive and you get out of your normal groove faster. That's just our, our experience. So we want you to have an attitude of playfulness and humor. And my brother, Brendan Boyle, who runs the uh, Toy Lab at IDEO, uh, wrote a book called The Klutz Book of Inventions. And there's a lot of ideas in here that might just be possible. <laughs> the Pogo Plunger, a funner plunger. The Helium Umbrella, uh, say goodbye to Helium Elbow. The Multi Mug, saves dishwashing time. Uh, <laughs> The don't even bother hiding the keys, hide a car. Um, the, the catch and release fly swatter, um, very humane. Uh, the, the programmable bathroom scale, we all love this. Lose as many pounds as you want by Friday. Uh, the pocketless Velcro pants, I wish I had this. Um, I need that. Uh, the bug zapper earrings. Um, Get those little suckers for good. And the salad washer shower head, which is very appropriate for us here in California, um, so that make that water do double duty. <laughs> and get your pets to, to do some work too around the house. The wiener cleaner. And then the long morning tricycle. So um, get the, your children to do a little work in the yard as well. So, you know, silly, crazy, you laugh, but our experience is if you really push yourself, if you're making your fellow team members laugh or like, ooh, that's wild, you're, you're ahead of the game. So that's what we're going to practice today. So we're going to do a tiny warm-up practice before I turn it over to Farzad to talk about the real project here. But uh, I sometimes hand out pencils, but there's 125 people here, so... I'm not going to do that, but you can all imagine a, a, a yellow Ticonderoga number two or number one pencil here. So we're going to do a one minute, one minute w um, warm up. So you pick a partner or two partners, whatever, and we're going to we're going to work for one minute to 
find the most original and out there use for a, a, a number two yellow pencil. And anything goes here. All right? Are you ready? Set? One minute. Go. I, sh I hear, I see a lot of smiling. More laughing is important. <laughs> shock your neighbor, shock your partner. All right, that's it. Who's got something that who's got something that will surprise the rest of this group right now? Who wants to uh, <laughs> donate an uh, uh, an idea? Matthew? Uh, nose blocker or torture device. Nose blocker or torture device. Okay, and anyone beat that? Yes. Finger extension to scratch your back. Finger extension to scratch your back. Lovely. Who else? Bookmarker. Bookmarker. Good. All right. Yes. Hair, hair styler, all right. It aerates your lawn and stirs your margarita. All right, very good. All right, I think we're going to end on that one because that's, that's lovely. All right, so, so I, I guess I'm not going to have to coach these people as much as I thought. So you guys are on the right track. So I'm going to turn this over to uh, Farzad now, my cardiologist partner. All right. Thank you, Dennis. All right, so thank you all for having us this afternoon. I'm gonna be speaking about a topic that I think is relevant for everyone in the healthcare profession. And I'm gonna start with a story actually. I was a groomsman in a wedding in Minneapolis uh, this past summer. And that's me right there. I'm a physician and the groom is a physician. And we've got a cardiologist, we've got a cardiac surgeon, we've got an orthopedic surgeon, we've got a urologist, we've got an ER doc. Pretty full stacked, fully stacked groomsmen squad there, I think. And the question here really is, who's the ticking time bomb? And so at the reception, the, the father of the bride actually collapsed and had a cardiac arrest. And this was identified by my cardiologist buddy. And I was actually outside waiting for an Uber at the end of the night. And I saw an ambulance pull up outside, and I looked to my buddy, and I said, that, that can't be here, can it? And the EMS guys got out, and I said, where are you guys going? And they said, we're going upstairs. There's a cardiac arrest. And so I ran upstairs, uh, nine floors in a museum there, and I knew where the AED was, because just by chance, as we were tour touring the facility before the wedding, I happened to see it. So I yelled to my buddy, I said, if there's not already somebody up there doing ch compressions or using an AED, you get the AED and I'll start chest compressions. We get up there, fortunately, all of the other groomsmen had already taken care of the situation. EMS went up there, they had all the right equipment and it was the perfect scenario. Uncle Curtis, or sorry, the father, Curtis is doing very well right now and has a new suit because we tore up his suit. But uh, this was the aftermath. And that, I thought that was the only decent picture that I could take uh, without violating anybody's uh, personal health information or otherwise. Um, another quick story. So last year, around Christmas time, uh, this was the day of the IDEO holiday party. And as many people do in, in the Palo Alto office, we take the Caltrain. And so I get onto the Caltrain, and I'm actually dressed up as Santa Claus this day. And on the way down to the party, um, the train stopped, and it was for a lot longer of a period than, than we had anticipated. And after a couple of minutes on the overhead speaker, they said, can somebody, please, if anybody's a physician, please run to the front of the train. There's somebody unresponsive. 
it was raining, it was pretty dark outside, and I'm wearing a Santa outfit. <laughs> and so I said, rather than running all the way through the train, I'm going to run outside along the side of the train. And so I get to the front car, I'm a wet, dripping Santa, and the doors are open, and I say, hi, I'm a cardiologist, I'm here if you need any help. And they say, sure you are, buddy, but come on in. So <laughs> I came in, and, and I was able to assess the situation but really, if you look at the inside of a Caltrain car, this is what's going on. You have people hanging over the railing. Nobody really prepared to handle a situation like this in public. And unfortunately, there were no other physicians who responded to this call. Uh, very fortunately, we were close to a fire department. EMS came very quickly, and we were able to resuscitate this person as well. This is later after, at the end of the night, when Dennis and I were actually on the train together, we were able to recap that story. And luckily, that was a good outcome. But again, we were lucky. So what if you're out in public and that's not the case, and you don't have people who are equipped to handle that type of situation? So I'd like to take a quick step back and identify two points in nomenclature that I think is important to, to, to know. You hear the term heart attack, you hear the term cardiac arrest, what's the difference between the two? And I, I'm sure many people here do know the difference, but I'm just gonna reiterate this. So a heart attack is a plumbing problem. So this is a, an angiogram of the blood vessels that feed the heart. And if you notice the, the one blood vessel labeled the LAD, that's a big main front pipe that feeds the front of the heart and covers a lot of territory. And here's an example where that blood supply has been knocked out for some reason. It's probably a fresh clot. And so you have all that downstream muscle, again, plumbing problem, that can then lead to an electrical problem, which is a cardiac arrest. So cardiac arrest, you go from a situation like this where you have a very sequential activation of electrical activity in the heart to something more like this that's unsustainable. So what do you do about this? So if we look at the numbers from last year from the American Heart Association, if you were to have an in-hospital cardiac arrest, so if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a cardiac arrest in a hospital and you're one of those 200,000 people, you have a pretty decent chance, decent, I mean you're already sick, you're in the hospital because you're sick, about a quarter of those people will survive. And we have also the luxury of having machines like this. Has anybody used a machine like this by any chance? The Lucas device? So it's an automated chest compression device. It's basically a toilet plunger that's automated. And then we also have, of course, our professional grade defibrillator. But as you can imagine, this isn't exactly something that you want to put out into public use because turning those dials, interpreting the data is very difficult to do. Now what happens if you're outside of the hospital? So these numbers are probably underreported. They're, they're quoting 350,000, but it's probably more than that. We just don't know about them. And so your survival rate is much lower, and the likelihood of somebody actually intervening, a bystander, to help out with CPR and, and AED is, is about half, whereas it's 100% in the hospital. So out of hospital cardiac arrest, what do you do? So if you're a bystander, Let's say somebody drops, drops down in the lobby here. So what do you do? Quick, re quick check of responsiveness is one. You're gonna call for help. So yell for an AED and 911. And actually, just as a point of interest, I asked where we would find an AED here. Does anybody happen to know where the AED is here in this hotel? It's actually not. So security actually handles that. So it's not accessible to any of us here. And I've actually noticed the same thing at some other hotels in downtown San Francisco, and it, it probably applies elsewhere, that there, there are some barriers to actually getting, get, getting AEDs. We, of course, do see them around, like in airports, and, and I'll show some examples of that, but it, it can be interesting and sometimes challenging to get your hands on one. And then once you've actually identified that this person does need CPR, you push hard and you push fast. So what does that look like? No, not all of our cardiac arrest victims are going to be laying nicely on a table like this, but... So, just like the diagram shows, I'm at mid-chest, I've got my hands interlocked here, and I'm going to go down at about 100 beats per minute, at a depth of 2 inches, allowing full recoil. And the reason for the full recoil is we're taking advantage of the mechanical action, the mechanical advantage of the chest wall to create a negative pressure to suck blood back in. And so we're really trying to create as effective of a pump as we can here. And you've got two choices here. You can either do this to the tune of staying alive, which you've probably heard. That's if you're an optimist. Uh, the pessimist's one is highway to hell. 
but they both work. So it's up to you. Um, Dennis and I have been putting together a collection of photos from airports that we've seen. You know, how, how do people actually display defibrillators in public from all over the world? We get kind of similar, similar displays, even some out. This was at, at Park City, Utah uh, last winter. So they're capable of even withstanding some, some extreme weather. And then interestingly, I saw this in, in the Cleveland airport two weeks ago. And this actually, you know, people are walking by it. I actually stopped and I took a video of it too. But it instructs you. It has a dummy there. And it instructs you how to do CPR. Which is really important because I think when we think, oh, hey, there's conveniently an AED right there, I think we're really missing the step before that, which is before you magically apply an AED to someone, you have to actually perform high quality chest compressions. The AED alone will not save them. Here's, an, here's a really cool example of something that I saw. I found this from a, a group of South Korean researchers who programmed a smartwatch to actually guide you through appropriate chest compressions. So what they've done here is they've programmed the watch to identify the frequency and the depth, interestingly, so that they use the entire territory of that screen to tell you whether or not you're going fast, slow, deep, shallow. So just an interesting, thought-provoking piece of information there. So some stats. So if you're able to apply CPR, high quality CPR and an AED before EMS arrives, you increase the survival rate by over 25%. One big problem is a lot of people don't have access to AEDs because as an example like here, we don't know where they are. So less than 2% are actually used out of hospital. That's, I think, not appropriate. So for every minute that goes by, your survival decreases by 7 to 10%. That's big. A lot of things get in the way of people intervening. I lived in the Mission neighborhood here uh, for a couple of years, and you have people all along the sides of the street, and you don't know, are they alive, are they dead? You have to kind of train yourself to do a quick assessment to tell whether or not they need some type of intervention, but how do you know? There are a lot of things that, you know, people, people either can't recognize a medical emergency, they lack the confidence to intervene, so there are a lot of, lot of things that, that really prevent you from helping, even if you can. And then, interestingly, things that increase likelihood of, of bystander intervention. I thought this first one is actually really neat. So if you grow up in a small community where people help each other out, you're more likely to intervene. So the size of the community, presence at the time of the event, of the event and some of these are, are a little bit more obvious if you've had previous training and so on. So now we're going to dive into a case study. So that, this is actually from the early 90s, but very relevant today still. So a local startup in Palo Alto came to IDEO. At the time, they were called HeartStream. And they asked the question to, to the designers, how might we enable a bystander to defibrillate a person who's having a cardiac arrest? So they had the technology that was, that was used in professional settings, but now they were able to make it smaller and they wanted to put it in a form that would be usable by a non-medically trained person. So the team went out and observed firefighters, EMS, and saw how do they store this device? How do they use it in public? And they sketched out some use case scenarios of how it might be used in a portable setting. And they said, okay, what about from the perspective of a healthcare professional? of an emergency first responder? What about from the perspective of somebody who's not a, an emergency responder? They made prototypes like this, and this is actually really important to, to take note here, that this prototype is paper. So it's put together probably in a, in a matter of minutes. There's nothing high fidelity about it. Of course, it doesn't work. But really, the point here is to say, when you hand someone this mystery box and they open it up, how will they interact with it? What are the elements that are critical to the, to the balance of anxiety and confidence? How do, you, how do you arm someone to handle this situation? Next, you take it up a level in fidelity. Maybe this is some type of carrying case that's foam core. And then really importantly, how do you test this? So the team then took these paper prototypes to the nearby shopping mall and threw a dummy down in front of a random person walking by and said, hey, this person's having a cardiac arrest. What are you going to do about it? Here's your equipment. Collected this data and ultimately were able to to create what is the first automated defibrillator that's, that's accessible to the public. This is now, through a series of acquisitions, the Philips device that you'll see around. And actually, this picture was taken on an airplane 
uh, when a former IDOR who designed the defibrillator uh, had it used on the plane. So the, the flight attendants were actually very, very uh, happy to share this picture with them, with the designer. So for today's challenge, what we'd like to do is create an awareness. We're going to ask a question together. Okay. Yeah. Actually, one other key here. So here's the defibrillator itself. And this is, this is the current version of the defibrillator that you'll see. But when you open it up, there, is, there are a series of interaction points that you're going to notice. One is when you take it out of the box, and I'm going to put the battery in here, the battery will be in it. Self-test. In case of emergency, press the green on-off button. So there's both an audio and a visual component to this. When you pull the lever, it if will... If the orange button is flashing, press it. So who, do we have any volunteers who wants to get defibrillated today? <laughs> we're going to defibrillate you, and then you just, I promise it'll be fine. <laughs> so the point here is that there are a number of pieces here that have been all tested to, to maximize somebody's confidence and ability to perform the task that they need to. Uh, from the placement of the pads, to the sequence of activation, to charging, to clearing, to allowing the best likelihood that the, that the shock will actually uh, engage with the myocardium and reset. So what we'd like to do now is propose this to you as a starting point, knowing what we've shown you as some background information on CPR, some background information on the use of the AED. How might we create an awareness of CPR and AED use at a large conference, let's say like this, or this coming week, to prepare untrained people for that critical few minutes. So in the tables that you're at right now, if you can, maybe if some t tables can get together and form groups of seven or eight, what we'd like to do is take 15 minutes and use the post-it notes, use what you have on the tables, and share back your first and second wildest ideas after fi 15 minutes of use. Yeah, this works best if the tables are fairly full. So if you guys in the back would join a table, that'd be good for these, these other tables, or join tables. All right, 15 minutes. Good. Okay. Actually,
Okay, so we have 10 minutes to go, 10 minutes.
Okay. All right. Two minute warning. Two minute warning. I think the best. Okay, Farzad. All right, we're going to try to share back about uh, 20 groups here quickly. Yeah. There was a question over here from the gentleman uh, uh, right over here who was saying, is it possible to play through the AED just because people are curious at the end of the show here? Yes, yes, yes. yes. All right, we're going to we're going to uh, hear from each group one by one. Everybody has an idea or two to share. So, we're going to start with this group that has a ringer Stefano in it. Do the drunk one. Okay, we have our two top ideas, uh, the most collaborative one started out saying, "Hey, listen, what about those buttons people used to wear about the heart disease?" And then somebody said, "Well, a company just launched a, a digital button where you can change a screen from your iPhone." And they said, "Well, if we did that, then everybody has a button, and the button changes color after you've interviewed with somebody, and now you can actually create a connection within the audience around this experience, which is interfacing with the button." And the other idea was um, so d like that was a, if if you've had the if you had some sort of training experience or you, some you know, transfer of knowledge somehow, right? Right, because it would be on the button. You okay. The information right. be here. Okay, good. All right, what else? Uh, we also had... Anything that will shock this crowd, Stefano? Uh, <laughs> yes, withholding coffee in the morning unless you've read two pages of the well, that. Oh, my God. <laughs> no one's ever... That, that would really work. Nobody gets hurt in, in, until I get my coffee or something, or, or vice versa. All right, good. I like that. Let's go to... Um, Let's go to this team. This is a ringer, a bunch of ringers here. Okay, we, we have to preface this by uh, saying we're going to talk a little bit about some uh, activities from South Dakota. Uh, anvil firing. Has anybody ever seen anvil firing? Okay, one. Uh, the, uh, so anvil firing is you take one metal anvil and you put a, a dish in it and you put gunpowder in there and you put another metal anvil on the top and you light it and the other anvil goes flying into the sky this big metal anvil. So it's a, it's a sport in South Dakota that they <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so the Olympic idea sport. was, because it's a little dangerous in our healthcare providers, we're going to do this under VR. So you have a VR booth as you walk in, um, and it's not advertised as anything except for a VR experience. And you go in there, and as you're walking down the street, you suddenly see somebody collapse, and you have to provide the appropriate care. And if you do it right, then the anvil shoots up in the air. And, <laughs> You know, you get a get a reward. It's like a like a fair. That's a nice build on your airport. I've not heard that one before. No. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's 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 a good one. All right, who else? Let's go back to that team. 
So yeah, we had a couple that we wanted to share. One was uh, not quite uh, like the coffee, but we were just lower the fees if you did watch an awareness video when you did enter uh, and come in. And the second one, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. He's having a heart attack when you say lower the fees. <laughs> I hit right into his heart. You might need, need that uh, EKG leader right now. <laughs> that deferred blood um, So, the, and then the, the other one we were talking about, which I think would be a lot of fun, which we were joking about modeling on the stage for you. But um, it's gonna be a flash dance mob before every conference, so you go through this whole, this whole process with you. Oh, oh, do you guys have that too? The, were you thinking about you that You win the groan factor. We could all dance together. That was the other thing. We could just <laughs> dance all together beforehand. Icebreaker. They mentioned that too. So, all right, very good. Are you guys ready? <laughs> That music. Beanie was talking about that music. You can get that one. Staying going. alive, yeah, right? Or highway to hell, right? Team, got one? <laughs> Drop the mic. Yeah. So the, uh, the easiest one was just in the opening remarks of the big conference to be able to announce where the AED is in the building and uh, just kind of a, a general public service announcement, which I've never seen in a conference No, before. never seen it. Uh, we never heard that, too. In a, in a big setting, like a 20,000 member convention hall, having an AED that pops smoke. So if, if, uh, if there is an alert, um, you would be able to hit a link on your app, on your, on your meeting app, and, and it would automatically show you with smoke and sound and everything where the device is. And then the last one was a little more high tech, which was, may not involve technology involved, invented yet, but the idea was to take uh, something like an Apple Watch or a wearable and have it sense when a patient or, or an individual is having a cardiac event, and then it would send like an alert out to the, through Bluetooth to all the surrounding devices, kind of override them so that they start to alert and pop up with instructions of what to do. Oh, that's good. For, for a three-person team, very, a lot of strong players over here. <laughs> Hire those guys. Yeah. Um, all right, over here. Ken's team? Iron Earth's team? Yeah, well, first of all, no one in our group wants to travel with Farzad. <clears throat> <laughs> um, the second thing was uh, most of the group was more interested. We want a robotic Alexa AED. Seek patient, defibrillate. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, it does not exist. It doesn't exist, right? So, but no, actually, so the serious idea was to include um, included on the conference apps with uh, educational portion that would open with the app. That was the serious. And the other was to create a video that was humorous around the Alexa app that would get people's attention with whatever information to follow. Kind of the airline thing, yeah. huh? All right. You're making me think right. now. All right. <laughs> don't, don't do it. <laughs> okay, who else? Come on, we gotta keep going here, else Stefano's gonna give All me right. the hook. Uh, we had a couple <laughs> ideas really about accessibility. Uh, one was having something on each table, maybe like a button and streamers would come down and instruction book, you know, information. Uh, maybe the tablecloths had printed stuff on them. The other one, um, because it's accessibility, is a regulatory requirement that all pink socks have to have sewn in instructions that you can just pull out. Whoa. Uh, Nick, are you here? Nick, good one. Like it. Nice. All right. All right. Here's a powerhouse team. So I think building on, on the app one, so every conference has an app. Our app will connect to, the, to Siri. So if you have a cardiac arrest, so Siri, we have a cardiac arrest. Siri will call the hospital, uh, the, the hotel front desk and say we need AED in this conference room, and then it will walk you through what the uh, things you need to do. So you ask the first question, is there a trained medical professional in the room? If not, do X, Y, Z. So all, right. all you have to do is just do a voice command. And Siri prompts you. Ah, good. Voice guided, yeah. yeah, very good. All right, lovely. Uh, we pick on the worst speaker and have a life experiment. <laughs> <laughs> As far as that? <laughs> I mean, and after that, we discussed what went right and what went wrong after All right, the, good. the experiment. The other idea is to have a cartoon, a little bit of right. a, a right, cartoon good. where no language is spoken mm. and uh, educational cartoon. Okay, good. That's a good point because See you do how? have people showing up who speak different languages, people coming from all, all, all over the world. So that's an important point. Even in 15 minutes, you guys are actually coming up with very functional possible ideas after you do some crazy ones. So come on, keep emphasizing that. Okay. Our so we have, uh, we have solutions for three stages of AD. One is uh, the training part. So, you know, it's a low-tech version. is requirement uh, for each employee 
to go through CPR training. I think it's bystanders can only be helpful if they went through the training. Uh, the other one is to have testimonials from patient and survivors. Uh, the provider and the survivor both, because what happens is most of the time when the AED requirement is there, they all fumble. Of course, the patient is kind of passed out, so the other person doesn't know what to do. And then, of course, um, those VR type drills, that's kind of the training portion. And the preparation time, a location finder for AED. So you enter a building, just like how Starbucks, you know where their Starbucks is on your phone, it tells you where the AED is on your phone. So um, any building that you enter, so then you can know where to go. And then third one is during the event. Um, that thing is scary <laughs> when it talks back to you. It's almost like you want Alexa to talk back to you or um, you know, your Google Maps lady or a Siri. So I think the voice needs to change because it's very scary for people to actually <laughs> listen to this. <laughs> uh, so that's something that we could use. Either connect to our phones, so a familiar device can guide us to, um, mm. to the AD. Absolutely, and I think that's that's really important to to take into account is that so much so much of the technology that we use in medicine has been developed a decade or plus ago. So now our expectations of technology are very different. We expect it to be more personalizable, right? More customizable. So that makes total sense. All right. Okay, we went we skipped the education went right to saving the patient. So All right. forgive us. But that's fair. Um, You're the we boss. decided at the back of every name tag we would have a peel off sensor and it would be an LED so you can slap that baby on your wrist and it would walk you through CPR instructions. And uh, at the same time, after you peeled it off, it initiated all of the mechanical robots to bring the AEDs to the site. Um, it would automatically give the e EMS system locations as well. And I think uh, the last thing it would do, it would bring down a holographic, so in case you didn't get it from here, you could, somebody could walk you through it holographically. Wow. I love using the badge. These guys. These guys. So, you know, before these pads can actually be applied effectively, you have to, for certain males, you have to make sure that they don't have hair on their chest that interferes with the, with the function of the pads. So w building on your idea, what if it were simply an adhesive and it's just used to tear the hair off so that you can effectively apply the patches, wow. right? Th for the point of, we have to build on each other's ideas. Yeah. All right. Well, All good. Right. Well, nice effort, guys. You're next. Nice effort. Build on it. <laughs> I see. That, that's exactly. That's a team. A very good example of a team just pushing the limits. And so if we had a day, we would actually start prototyping some of these. Okay, let's make something like that work here. And so a hackathon would come out, and that's where that pill pack thing in one day hackathon. That's a hundred million dollar business now or so. So. That you, all right, we'll, we'll talk to you guys later. Um, <laughs> anyway, keep going. All right, great. We had a few ideas. Uh, we definitely like the flash mob idea, uh, especially, especially doing that to staying alive and having that happen at, at the conference. Um, playing off the food idea, we wanted to have some napkins or coffee cups and things printed with the instructions so that everybody's going to go get coffee and something to eat. They can, they can see it there. Um, we also uh, went got involved in some uh, ideas that, that revolved around the bathrooms. Um, so urinal cakes and, uh, and instructions above the, the, the toilets. Urinal cakes, um, oh, nice. And the back of the doors just to give some instructions on awareness. And uh, the idea I think most of the people here at the table liked the most was having uh, an actor come out for the opening session to make the introductions, uh, but then actually have a cardiac arrest on the stage and then go through uh, uh, some of the things that were done <laughs> correctly or incorrectly to save that person. Wow, great. Right, great Excellent. work, guys. Inspiring. And the the the, uh, the well the cakes. I've never heard that a one. A lot of our ideas have been already discussed, so I just came up with one on the fly. Okay. <laughs> I have two actually. One is why even have AEDs? Why not just make a pill instead that achieves the same effect of what you're trying to do? The second one is putting a probe on your phone. Why have a big device like that, um, why can't you put something in your phone that's a probe that you could use instead? All right. Make your phone on AED, yeah. huh? Yeah. You just need to get a new phone. Have a no little problem. reserve battery, so you've got enough well, charge. Well, you know, I'm thinking ahead. <laughs> Make sure you don't run out of battery. I'm yeah. thinking ahead. We had it some of the other Maybe ones, though. Maybe like you automatically <laughs> if it senses. <laughs> that's right. Lovely. Yeah. All right. Good. Get you your like new it? Apple phone battery <laughs> for $29. This is a fun dollars. group. They want to keep brainstorming. I love it. All right. 
so I'm not allowed to say use capture proof. Um, <laughs> some of ours that we had were a scavenger hunt, so the first team to get their selfie with the AED. Um, oh, that's great. That's great. Compression contest. We could have people come up with the Mac guy and see who can last the longest doing the compressions properly. Ooh. And um, we did the mock attack and cartoon like everyone else. I liked hula dancers to start to educate the five and a hundred. Those are ours. Very good. All right. Any last last team here? Are we good? One more team. All right. We're gonna so we went with an final. entertainment theme. Um, we also had a robot um, and uh, played on the ideas of uh, around the table here. And we decided that we would have a ventriloquist. You have to go back to vaudeville now. This is really old technology. Um, do a performance, and the ventriloquist drops, has a heart attack. And the dummy says, hey, I'm just a dummy but let me walk you through this. <laughs> here's, here's the twist. The dummy's actually a robot and can do it and then have the AED delivered by a drone. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> All right, well, um, that, was a, that was an excellent experience. This is a, a wonderful group and, and we just want you to leave with the fact that, you know, yeah, there's some laughing, there's some silliness, but Actually, that is the way that uh, good ideas come. Sometimes what we do is we say, okay, have, tell us your best two ideas and your two craziest ideas. And then for the next couple hours, you say, throw the good ideas out and make the crazy ideas work. And things are much better by doing it that way. It's just, this is a, a little piece to take away in, in your, in your, in your um, life to m make ideation better. Uh, really understanding that there are there are moments when you have permission to be generative and to come up with things like this, and obviously are, there are many other moments where where you have to focus, right? So as long as everybody's on the same page and has the permission to do so at those different times, you can come up with things that you wouldn't have other, otherwise come up with as an individual. So I think this is awesome. I think everybody walked away with with a little bit more thought into a public service uh, condition that's very relevant to everyone. And hopefully you think further about this, whether you decide to act on it is another thing, but I think uh, we all had a great time, so glad we could all do this together. So thanks again for, for participating.